Welcome back to our lecture series, Math 4220, Abstract Algebra 1 for students at Southern Utah University. As usual, I'll be your professor today, Dr. Andrew Misseldine. In lecture 31, we're going to talk about the idea of a factor group, sometimes called a quotient group, but we're going to do that in the next video properly. Um, in this video, I want to continue our discussion of conjugates and conjugacy classes that we introduced at the end of lecture 30. Um, we had, in, in our last video, we actually have proven that the conjugates in the symmetric group occur exactly when two permutations have the same cycle structure, right? So we want to give in this uh, in this video some sufficient and necessary conditions to know when two elements of the dihedral group are in fact conjugates of each other. So let dn be the order 2n dihedral group. That is, it's the symmetry group of the n, uh, the regular n-gon. And so when it comes to the dihedral group, basically we can classify the elements in one of two families. There's the rotations uh, of the di of the of the n gon, right? We're going to call those R, right? So R is a single rotation counterclockwise. Uh, so you have the rotations in there, which will include the identity, which you think of as a zero degree rotation. And then there's also going to be the reflections, for which you can reflect across, you know, the x-axis, y-axis, or various oblique lines passing through your your polygon there. And so how does the consciousy classes of these elements, how are they determined? Well, it turns out for rotations, it's fairly simple. An element will be uh, clearly every element, like if you just take an arbitrary rotation r to the k, it's clearly going to be conjugate to itself because consciousy gives us a equivalence relationship. But in the dihedral group, the only other element that a rotation can be conjugate to would be its inverse. Now this gives us a very, assuming this is true, this gives us a very interesting corollary. When, when n is an even number, that means r to the k will be conjugate to itself. And the only other element it would be conjugate to would be r to the negative k, which it's, it's itself again, right? If the number is in fact even, um, which would tell you in that situation that if you take, if you take half of the rotation, like half of the degree there, uh, that element is going to be central because the only thing conjugate to it is itself. Um, and so that helps one determine the center of the dihedral group, right? The dihedral group, if you have the dihedral group 2K, then its center is going to be the identity and this ro half rotation, half spin, right? Um, on the other hand, when you have an odd dihedral group, then it will be centerless. That is the only thing in there is the identity. So that's kind of like a happy little uh, consequence of this observation here that rotations are only conjugate to each other. Now you might be like, well, why aren't there any reflections in the center? We'll see that in just a second. When it comes to the reflections, there's two possibilities and this depends whether you're even or odd. If the degree of the dihedral group is odd, then it turns out there's only one consciousness class that contains all the reflections. All the reflections would be uh, conjugate to each other. On the other hand, if n is even, there'll be two consciousy classes uh, based upon parity that um, you'll have, you'll have, because uh, after all, every element of the dihedral group can be written in this normal form, r to the k s, or r to the k, but for reflections, it'll look like r to the k s. If the exponent is an even number, then that'll be in the even class. And if k is an odd number, then it'll be in the odd class. So you have these two consciousy classes based upon parity when the degree is even, uh, but when the degree is odd, they all get glued together. So, let, so let's prove the first statement. And I, I guess before we prove that, just getting back to the comment about the, the center here. Well, because the center, and since these reflections are always glued to something, whether it's glued to all the reflections or half the reflections, there is no reflection in the dihedral group that can be central. So we get the we get the claims we had earlier, if this theorem was true. So now let's prove it. Uh, so to prove it, we're going to first start off with the statement about the rotations, right? Why is why are rotations only conjugate to their inverses, uh, amongst other things, right? So let's take a typical rotation r to the k. Now we know that L, powers of R will commute with each other. So if I take R to the K and I, and I conjugate it by R to the M and its inverse R to the negative M, well, these are just powers of R, right? So they're just gonna commute with each other. So you can, you can commute the RM with the RK, in which case you get this, R to the M and R to the negative, it will cancel as so R to the K, right? So when you conjugate R to the K by a rotation, you'll just get back itself, it's left unmoved. The reflection is what's going to produce this inversion going on right here. So if you have a reflection, you have 
A typical reflection will look like r to the ms. You're going to conjugate r to the k by that reflection, and it's inverse, r to the ms, inverse, right? So some things to remember here about uh, reflections, they're equal to their own inverses, but if you use the Shusok principle, you're going to switch these things around their order when you take the inverse, in which case then the inverse here is going to look like S inverse R to the M inverse. So, so taking the Shusok principle here and also redoing parentheses, I first have to conjugate R to the K by S first. And so what happens in that situation? We've seen previously that if you want to pass a reflection, pass a rotation inside of the dihedral group, then you can move S past R, but you have to take the inverse of R. And so that's going to end up giving us R to the N minus K S S inverse. You get its inverse like so. Then the S's will cancel out. So we then get R M R to the N minus K R to the N minus M. And like we said before, uh, rotations were, were, uh, can be with each other. So you get R to the N minus K, then R M R minus M, they cancel out. So you just get r to the n minus k, or you could just abbreviate that as r to the negative k. And so we see that when you conjugate a rotation by a rotation, you get back itself. If you conjugate a rotation by a reflection, you get back its inverse. And as every element of the dihedral group is either rotation or reflection, that exhausts all possibilities. So the consciousness class of a rotation will always be itself and its inverse. Those are the only possibilities. Okay. Uh, let's take a look at reflections. Reflections, you have to be a little bit more careful, but we can handle it. No problem here. So if you take a typical reflection in the dihedral group, it, its normal form will look like r to the k times s. Well, we can conjugate this reflection by a typical rotation. What happens there? r to the m and r to the negative m. So again, looking at multiplication here, what I want to do is I want to switch the order of s and r to the negative m. But like we said a moment ago, to pass an r by an S, you have to take the inverse of the R. So R to the M, when it moves to the left, will become, excuse me, R to the negative M, when it moves to the left, will become R to the M. And then, as these are all just powers of R, you can squish them all together, and we see that we end up with a reflection right here, a reflection of R to the K plus 2MS. So we get that R to the K S will be conjugate to R to the K plus 2MS, right? So notice in this situation, if we have r to the k s, this is it's it's conjugate to a reflection, but comparing the powers of the rotation here, um, you have k and you have k plus two m, right? So what this tells you is that you know if you had some typical some typical element r k s, it's conjugate to a reflection r l s, right? What this observation is telling you above is that one possibility here is if l is congruent to k mod two. Right, because when you look at k versus k plus 2m, those two numbers have the same parity. They're either both even numbers or they're both odd numbers because you're adding some potential arbitrary. Because after all, m was arbitrary here. It's an arbitrary multiple of 2 to them. So if, if k and l have the same parity, then they will be conjugate to each other. All right, and so that kind of leads to that kind of leads to the above case, right? Didn't we mention this earlier that if the degree is even, then the consciousness classes will be based upon parity. The evens are conjugate to each other and the odds are conjugate to each other. We've proven that. Um, when you're odd, it's a single consciousness class, which means we take these two sets and we glue them together, which is true in the case we're in. We just have to glue them together somehow. So what we want to then argue, because we now know if the power of the rotation has the same parity, the, the reflections will be conjugate to each other. What we have to now prove is that when you're odd, when your degree is odd, you, you can glue these things together. But when you're even, these are distinguishable, okay? Uh, so before we can do that, let's make one other comment here. Uh, so this is what happens if we rotated, excuse me, if we, ref, if we conjugate a reflection by a rotation. What happens if you conjugate a reflection by a reflection? Well, the calculation is going to be similar, all right? But if you draw this thing out, you're going to get R, M, S, R, K, S, you're gonna get then S inverse R to the negative M, right? The S's cancel out. We're going to then get R M S K, excuse me, R to the K minus M. Commute the S with R, which gives you the inverse R M R K minus M. We're gonna get S like that. Oh, I forgot to take the inverse there. So take a negative sign. And then when you combine those together, you're gonna to get R to the two M minus K times S right? Uh, which is what we have right here, which admittedly above, I wrote it as 
n minus k plus 2s, same basic idea. So then th this, this summarizes what we've observed so far. Let me get this out of the way. So notice what we observed so far. So the first condition, this conjugation relationship tells us that, oh, k and l could have the same parity. That would force them to be conjugate. The other option is that k, n minus k and l must have the same parity. Okay, so either, so in order for this to work, either K and L have the same parity or L has the same parity as the inverse, the additive inverse of K in that situation, mod N. All right, so that, that's the situation we're in. So let's consider the two possibilities. Now, in the case that N is even, N is even, I want you to be aware that these two observations tell us the same thing. All right, because this equation right here uh, let, me, let me kind of rewrite it here. We're going to rewrite this equation the following way. You could write this as k plus l is congruent to n mod 2. Okay? So this first statement says they have the same parity. This one says that when you add them together, it'll have the same parity as n. Well, if n is an even number, right, that means it's congruent to 2. Uh, I should say uh, it's a multiple of 2, therefore it's congruent to 0 mod 2. Now, if k plus l, have, if their sum is 0 mod 2, that means they have the same parity because evens plus evens give you an even. Odd plus odd gives you an even. And if it's even and odd mismatched, you'll get back an odd. So k plus l have, being congruent to 0 suggests they have the same parity. So that means that this statement and this statement are identical, right? They don't give you two different statements. They give you the one statement. So the only way that two reflections are conjugate to each other is if their powers of the rotations have the same parity. And that then gives us the two classes we had before. For even degree, the two classes are based upon parity. There's no way to mix them together. Now, when you're odd, right, let's look at the statement, k plus l. Well, if you're odd, okay, then n being odd means that it's gonna be congruent to one mod, mod, what? Mod two, clearly that was a typo there, sorry. Uh, so k plus l being congruent to 1 mod 2 means they have different parities. But, so wait, okay. If they have the same parity, they're conjugate. But if they have different parities, they're conjugate. That doesn't leave a lot of wiggle room, right? I mean, if you're, you're two numbers either have the same parity or they have different parities. And so in either situation, boom, they're conjugate. And so this then explains that all of the reflections are conjugates to each other in an odd dihedral group. Okay? And so some another takeaway I want to mention about this theorem here, because we've now finished the proof, is look at the rotation subgroup. That is the cyclic subgroup generated by a single rotation. Well, we mentioned earlier that the consciousness classes of rotations are just the rotation and its inverse. This tells us that the rotation subgroup is a union of consciousness classes, uh, which implies that it's actually a normal subgroup. So we actually always get that the rotation, the rotational subgroup, the dihedral group is a normal subgroup. It's a very important normal subgroup. Another argument you could make is that the rotation subgroup is actually a subgroup of index two, which also is another argument that it is that it is a uh, normal. But in this regard, I wanted to make the mention that since it's a union of consciousy classes, uh, that implies it's normal because normal subgroups are exactly those subgroups which are closed under conjugation.